Hi, everyone. I'm Ed Baker. Welcome to the Addiction Recovery Channel. I can't even tell you how excited I am uh, today to be with this distinguished panel of guests, mighty warriors, trailblazers of recovery uh, in Vermont. Uh, for people familiar with the show, you know that we've always been devoted to reducing and eventually eliminating the stigma that's wrongfully attached to people with substance use disorder. And the way we do this is by raising consciousness. Today, the show is very special indeed, because as we raise consciousness, we're also going to be raising funds for two of the three keystone components of this recovery movement that we are building in Vermont. The two components being recovery housing and recovery centers. Uh, my distinguished uh, guests are Ron Stankovic, uh, Community Outreach Director for Dominion Diagnostics. Thank you, Ron, for your dedication over the years. Peter Espenshade, President of Recovery Vermont. Part of everything recovery. Thank you, Peter, for your service. David Regal, the Executive Director of Vermont Foundation of Recovery really, really setting the standard for sober housing in Vermont and elsewhere. Thank you, David. And um, uh, Tracy Hauk, who is the director of the Rutland Turning Point, one of a system of 12 turning point centers in Vermont that are out there. They're the heartbeat of recovery in Vermont. Thank you so much, Tracy, for your work. With that, I'm going to begin the show by handing it over to Ron with his very, very special announcement. Uh, thanks, Ed. Um, I, I will hopefully not take very long here because I really want the focus to be on our recovery centers, our recovery homes, and the very, very important role that Recovery Vermont is taking um, in this recovery challenge. It, it, in a couple of heartbeats, that the challenge is designed to challenge perception, to challenge perception by addressing the stigma of substance use disorder in which we showcase and promote and celebrate the fact that Vermonters can and do recover all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's about celebrating the support that is given to Vermonters in recovery, in particularly our 12 recovery centers, which have a vast array of programming to meet someone in recovery where they're at, so that their goal of a lifelong journey of recovery is realized. And in concert with that, it's about providing a safe and supportive environment that our recovery homes do. And what's what many may not realize is how intertwined our centers and our homes are. Um, that V4 in particular looks for homes in high quality neighborhoods that are close to recovery centers. So it's almost a 24 seven approach of arms being wrapped around a person in recovery. So aside from addressing the stigma, showcasing that with support individuals can and do recover, it's about celebrating what our centers and our homes do and also to provide the opportunity to recognize that our centers and our homes, they're nonprofits. And that hopefully during Recovery Vermont, and our theme is recovery and the community side by side. Our homes and our centers support individuals in recovery. Now it's time for us as Vermonters to support those homes and those centers, period. Now, I would be really remiss if I didn't give a lot of credit here to Peter Espenshade and Recovery Vermont. Mm -hmm. When we first floated the idea of a challenge, he said, look, Recovery Vermont shouldn't be part of this in terms of monies received, but he wanted to play an active role. So Recovery Vermont is serving as the fiscal agent, which simply means they will receive all donations, pay every related fee under the sun, such as cash apps and credit cards. Right. So that 100%, and I'm going to say this again, because you rarely, if ever, find a fundraising public awareness campaign where 100% of monies raised will go to one of the centers or one of the homes. 
So that's why these three are here because they do the direct service work. Dominion, my role was really providing backbone support and bringing the group together with the conscious effort of we need to celebrate recovery. We need to promote what recovery organizations do and also showcase that your generosity can and will make a huge difference in the lives of those in recovery that they support. I think that's enough for me. <laughs> Beautiful, and thank you. Thank you, Ron. Uh, just to mention that during the show, there will be a banner uh, distributed uh, or, or exhibited down the bottom of the screen that'll tell you uh, what the site is uh, for, for donating. And at the end of the show, there'll be a lingering um, screen that will also show the uh, link that people can uh, donate to. So along those lines, um, we, we figured at the beginning of the show, if every Vermonter gives $1, we'll have $560,000. So, so don't, be, don't be shy uh, with your, with your don donations. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Peter Espenshade. Peter, would you begin to maybe talk a little bit about uh, recovery housing and what, it's, what, what you've seen over the years, what it means to you? Yeah, I mean, just to, uh, to take a step back, one of the things that I'm really excited about with the recovery movement is how we're defining the term recovery itself. Mm. You know, back in the day, it used to be recovery was defined as abstinence or sobriety. And you know, that's obviously part of the picture, but it's, it's not the whole picture at all. And it's not really the way recovery works. We're now operating kind of under Johan Hari's theory that the opposite of addiction is connection. Mm. And that's what makes recovery strong. You know, a connection to a place to live, reconnection to family, connection to employment, connection to one's community and hobbies. We know that that's what really defines recovery. And uh, one of the real innovative <laughs> movements in Vermont and nationwide is what we call the recovery residence movement. If you don't have a safe, clean, supportive, happy uh, home, your recovery is gonna be so much harder. So in Vermont, we've got a whole series, whole network of certified recovery residences. These are places that meet the best national standards and that serve as homes for folks who are working really hard on their recovery and working really hard in their communities to give back, to be good citizens, to be employed, to be good neighbors, etc. cetera. Right. And I think we need to keep bolstering that and we need to keep growing that movement and it is so well personified by um, my friend and colleague, Dave Regal, and his work um, at V4 and sort of the work throughout the state. Thank you, thank you, Peter. To just underscore that, um, the American Society of Addiction Medicine in 2019, when they were commenting on their new definition of addiction, made a point to stress that uh, People who uh, were denied access to adequate housing, who were at risk for addiction, would be more at risk to develop addiction because of housing frustrations. And people who were striving toward recovery would be, in fact, less resilient and less capable of achieving and maintaining recovery if they experienced housing frustrations. So. Just to underline what you're saying, Peter, about the, the absolute crucial importance of housing. Now we have, we have uh, Harley uh, Larock. We have a video uh, vignette of Harley Larock, who's going to tell us exactly uh, how important um, recovery housing was and is for him. So we can roll that vignette now, please. Hi, my name is Harley Larock. Uh, I'm a person of long-term recovery. Uh, I guess starting off, I'll just say, like, as a kid, I, uh, you know, I felt fear and anxiety, and I just didn't, I, I just didn't feel right, um, you know, so I spent a lot of my uh, future life, you know, trying to escape reality with uh, substances from, you know, uh, one to, to the next, and uh, just, just to kind of escape reality, and, 
you know, in 2016, uh, I overdosed and, and ended up in, in a coma in the ICU uh, where I damaged my heart and my brain. And uh, uh, fortunately, I woke up and I realized, uh, you know, maybe a couple of weeks later that, that I had to change uh, or I was going to die. Um, mm-hmm. So a friend had suggested uh, recovery housing uh, and gave me the number to Vermont Foundation of Recovery. And, uh, you know, I joined uh, as a member in uh, February of 12th of 2017. And, uh, you know, one of the things that someone had taught me in recovery was, you know, there's one thing that you have to change and that's everything. And I, I believe that uh, there was a lot that I had to change uh, the way I was living my life and the rules that I had adopted and were living by uh, definitely did not work. Uh, so what V4 offered me was structure accountability and and rules to live by that I had not been born with or been taught up until that point in my life. Um, I believed in the process and my life changed very quickly. Uh, As I was, I was following these rules and living this new life, uh, you know, change happened pretty quickly. Um, And, you know, I guess that's what I needed to to believe in the process. Um, And because of that, you know, I, I, uh, I left a career of, of fine dining, cooking, uh, to become a uh, recovery house manager at V4 in 2019. And, uh, you know, I've kind of uh, stepped the ladder at V4 and, and become uh, an admin. Uh, I also do the admissions and, uh, and I still manage the recovery house in St. Albans. And I guess, you know, how the life has changed for me is, there's been a lot of firsts that have occurred in my life. Uh, first car loan at 39. Uh, I'm now in my first apartment uh, where I pay the bills and, and rent on time. Mm. Uh, you know, I enjoy uh, volunteering and, and helping my community. Uh, you know, I, I try to hang out with my family as much as I can. Uh, you know, I've adapted uh, writing. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a poet. Uh, I do um, other types of art. I've been a musician um, in, uh, while living at V4. Uh, many different things that I wasn't able to like focus on and, and do while I was in uh, active use. Um, Beautiful. You know, and you know, what V4 has, has given me is a life that I never knew I wanted uh, or deserved or could achieve. And um, you know, just by adapting these rules and, and policies and living them to the best of my ability, uh, I have a life today that that uh, you know is, is is a miracle that I'm I'm very grateful for. Well, thank you, Harley. Thank you for your courage and your uh, genuine, uh, you know, just uh, the truth about your life. I mean, I could see in, in everyone's faces, the panel's faces, we're all filled with joy. We all have goose pimples. Here's a kid who. Uh, you know, overdoses and damages his brain and his heart wakes up in a, you know, an emergency room. A few months later, he uh, registers at V4. And it's a, a life-changing experience. He talks about structure, accountability, rules. You know, everybody's pathway to recovery is different. You know, David, can you just please elaborate on, on, on what's going on at the Vermont, um, you know, Foundation of Recovery, what is what are these miracles that that are being enabled there? What's going on? Well, thank you very much, Ed. And I mean, Harley, I don't know that I could ever say it any better than what Harley did, right? I mean, what what a shining example of somebody who um, you know reached a place in their lives where they were willing and, and able and surrounded by love and people who cared about them and had the support and the structure to, um, and, and the resources to change their lives. And, and Harley deserves the credit. And one of the things that I, that I will say is that, you know, recovery housing is amazing. And, and the magic of it is not anything that, that we do. The, the magic of a recovery residence is the peer-to-peer support and the connections that the members of the home create mm. while living. It's, it's, <laughs> the magic is what happens at eight o'clock at night when people are sitting on the couch, flipping through the television, 
talking about their day and somebody's explaining how frustrated they were that their uh, supervisor at work got on their case because they took too long of a break. And the other person who maybe has been there a little bit longer or maybe just has more work experience says, oh, well, that's interesting. The way that I found to avoid that is to not take too long of a break. <laughs> and they just keep going about watching television because it's not coming from an authority figure. It's coming from somebody else who is walking the same path and is, is moving in the same direction and is genuinely sharing their experience of a strategy that's worked for them to overcome that particular challenge, right? And that's a very, very small example, but it, it happens you know, on a, an exponential scale in recovery residences every day where people are creating these connections, they develop a bond and trust with each other they're comfortable sharing about their real life experience and learning from one another. Um, so it, it's just an, an incredible environment. And our role at, at Vermont Foundation of Recovery is really to try to create those spaces for, for that magic to be able to happen and, and have homes that are set up in, in a way that is as family-like as they can be in, in good neighborhoods, like Peter had mentioned earlier, that are close to recovery supports, close to transportation, close to employment opportunities, and, and really you know, allow people the very best chance at, at connecting with the community within their home and connecting with the community that their home is in. And, and really um, you know, getting back to being valued members of society yeah. because you know i myself am a person in recovery and to me that means that i haven't um ingested a mood or mind altering substance that wasn't prescribed by a doctor since january of 2007 and i can tell you thank you i you know i really appreciate it but a lot of the credit goes to the people that came before me and the folks that were there and were present and available and supportive and willing to share their experiences as my peers nice. when I finally became willing to, to enter into recovery. And um, if it wasn't for that support and it wasn't for the people that came before me, I would be lost. And, and that's you know the environment that the recovery centers, which we're gonna hear about later, they create those opportunities for connection with people um, who have been in recovery in some way, shape, or form for a period of time that people who are new can relate to. And the same thing with the recovery residences. And my experience was that I entered recovery without a lot of life skills. You know, I didn't know how to do laundry. I didn't know how to balance a checkbook or, or budget my money. I didn't know how to write a grocery list, go shopping, buy those items and create meals out of that, right? Like that's not, that was not my experience when I went to a grocery store. I wandered around and I found things that I like to eat and I put them in the cart and then went home and tried to figure out how am I going to eat off of this for a week? I just, I didn't have that skill set. But when I was in early recovery, I had other skill sets that I could bring to the table and share with others. And we were able to learn from each other and grow based on all of our collective experiences. And so, you know, it's really a privilege for me to be a part of Vermont Foundation of Recovery. I consider myself, you know, blessed to be able to serve. And the mission of the organization is to create a statewide network of recovery homes to help people suffering from substance use disorders reassimilate into society by supporting the transitions from active use to recovery to independent living. And so when Harley shared about the first in his life, I mean, my, my heart is full, right? To, to hear somebody be able to share about having their first, you know, automobile loan and having their own apartment to call home and the utilities in their own, right? Because that's what it's all about is just providing people with the space to, to grow personally and achieve whatever their own goals are. And, and there is a structure within the home. We do hold people accountable. 
Um, anybody that's a member of V4 can choose their own recovery path, whatever that may look like for them, whatever they believe is the right combination of, of resources and supports that are out there. However, you have to have a recovery path, um, you know, and you have to be engaged with that. And so that involves a certain number of activities per week. Uh, that changes as you've been in the home for a little while. You know, it requires people to either work or go to school or volunteer at least 20 hours a week. It, it, and a lot of that is based on self-esteem. And, and people build self-esteem by being active members in communities outside of the home and, and, and also feeling like folks are able to stand on their own two feet. So people do pay weekly membership dues to be part of the organization. And, and again, that comes back, we charge people about half of what the cost is to actually be able to provide a space in one of our homes and, and for people to be um, you know, engaged with the other supports and member services that come with membership. But we do feel like it's important that there be something that people are doing to um, be self-sustaining and self-supporting and that there is self-esteem that comes from that. And then, you know, there's a weekly house meeting where people come together and sort of talk about the challenges within the home and how to resolve those and develop those skills of working together and, and connecting with each other and managing conflict and being good roommates and all, all of those types of things that come along with living with others that, again, are skill sets that I, I spent a long time living with other people when I was in active uh, use of substances. But I don't know that I was a very good roommate or housemate during that period of time, right? And, and those are skills that I needed to develop. I needed to think about others and I needed to think about being selfless and trying to give more than I take. And, um, you know, all of that are things that are sort of um, guided or uh, cultivated through house meetings and in, in recovery residences. And then, you know, I think what's really important for folks to understand is that you know, as Peter will remember, a lot of the, the work in Vermont stems from a task force that was born out of an advisory committee um, at, you know, I think back then it was referred to as BAMHAR, but now is, is Recovery Vermont. And, and um, you know, we created a task force to look at bringing a nice. Vermont affiliate of the National Alliance of Recovery Residences, which is called NAR, uh, to Vermont and get it started. And that's what that task force did. It created the Vermont Alliance of Recovery Residences, which is VTAR. Um, they have national standards and national code of ethics. There's a, a national conference that goes on. Best practices are shared. There are um, two different week, uh, monthly um, information sharing sessions that you know utilize video technology like we're doing now to keep people connected and, and really moving forward and making sure that that social model of recovery is practiced in certified recovery homes all throughout the country. And so the uh, Vermont Alliance of Recovery Residents has certified seven homes, uh, sorry, 17 homes. V4 oh, wow. has six homes and we have three transitional apartments uh, serving um, up to 40 individuals at a time. And we also employ uh, about seven people who are in recovery themselves. The majority of our board of directors are people who are in recovery. Um, you know, so what a gift to be a part of an organization that touches the lives of, you know, 50 or so individuals on any given day who are in recovery in the state of Vermont. And what a gift to be a part of this kind of a initiative. And, and I can't, thank Ron and Dominion and Peter and Recovery Vermont and Ed yourself and the ARC show for giving us the opportunity because the recovery centers and you know people like Tracy are doing incredible work to support folks who are in recovery. And not only is it you know morally and ethically the right thing to do to help our fellow citizens and provide all individuals with the best chance at being successful in their lives as possible. But it's also good for our communities. It, it is a good investment mm -hmm. of, of time and resources to give people the best chance because as Harley mentioned, right? Like he is 
giving back to society, there is a return on the investment that was made in Harley's sure. recovery, right? And, and there was a ter- return to society in the investment made on my own recovery. Um, you know, people who are in recovery have higher than average earning potential. You know, they, they are the first ones to volunteer and want to give back. They, they are coaches of, of sports teams and they are serving on, you know, boards and they are, you know, at the community, county, state, federal, right? Like all of the people who are in recovery, given the opportunity and the space to be able to get well and the support and the guidance and, and the, the love to be able to be healthy again give back and contribute to our society in a really meaningful way. Nice. And, nice. and it, it just makes sense that we would want to give those folks the best chance that we possibly can. And so, you know, the efforts that Recovery Vermont is making to allow this project to, to move forward and not have any fees and be that fiscal agent the efforts that Ron and Dominion Diagnostics have made to make this possible and just have the idea, your efforts, Ed, to help get the message out and always be combating stigma and giving Vermonters the best chance is just incredible. And we're so grateful and we hope that, you know, people will learn a little bit. People will understand that, you know, folks who are in recovery are just people like any other, there's a good chance that we are all interacting with folks who are in recovery every day of our lives. And we don't ever know it unless they take the time to sit down and share it with us. And, um, you know, it, it, I hope that if folks are able to, they're, you know, willing to, to contribute to the challenge and, um, support great resources like the recovery centers that are out there and, and recovery residences throughout Vermont. So thank you all very much for, for allowing us to, to be a part of it. Well, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, David. I mean, you are, and, and all the panel members are, are surely examples of uh, individuals whose minds are um, in science, whose minds are in research, whose minds are in uh, an awareness and a dedication to best practices for this particular population. But while our minds are occupied with all that stuff, our hearts are in compassion. And that's the best possible combination you can have. So for the viewing audience out there, David um, was very articulate. And, uh, you know, in closing, he mentioned what the people on this panel are doing. And I just want to extend the invitation to the viewing audience, because I know how many people want to do something. Not everybody is fortunate enough to work in this field or even to know what to do, but I know you all want to do something. So jot down the link that's running in the banner on the show and don't hesitate. Just don't hesitate. Just give a little of yourself freely and um, be be, uh, as much a part of this as you can possibly be. So with that, I'm just checking our time here. We're, we're, doing, we're doing pretty good. So is there anybody else that wants to uh, pop in on this particular topic of, of um, you know, recovery housing and maybe uh, you know, comment on, on uh, a little further on this? All right. Well, I'd okay. like to say, um, you know, recovery housing, I mean, the work that we do at the recovery centers, mm-hmm. you know, the frustrating part is that there is so many people we serve that are homeless, mm-hmm. right? And you, how can they get on their path to recovery when they don't have a stable place to live? So having more recovery residences, having safe places for them to go is, is an absolute necessity. You know, you, it's very hard for people that are homeless, living in tents, couch surfing, yeah. to even get a smidgen of a hold of what recovery looks like. Yeah, yeah. very, very difficult. In fact, maybe, maybe impossible. You know, before the show, I was kind of thinking about, you know, just thinking about everything. And, um, you know, Abraham Maslow, people get mad at me for bringing up Abraham Maslow. Everybody studied Abraham Maslow in Introduction to Sociology many years ago. It's very basic. Abraham Maslow came up with this thing called the hierarchy of need. 
and the most basic needs were at the bottom of a triangle. And then they got more, uh, you know, um, refined over, over, over time, the highest need being the need for creativity. But, but, but housing, the safety of a place to be is a very, very, very basic need. What can you do if you don't have a safe place to be? Practically, practically, you're practically set up uh, to continue to, to, um, to use drugs. So with that, I'd like to move into the next um, segment. Peter, would you care to comment a little bit on uh, you know, recovery centers in particular? Yeah, thank you, Ed. The, um, it, you know, again, I think we've seen a big paradigm shift in recovery over the past decade or so. Just 10 years ago or 15 years ago, if you, if you were an individual who was curious about recovery or wanted to get into recovery, you know, where did you go? Where did you, you wouldn't know where to go in many cases. So over the years, Vermont has developed a, you know, an entire network of recovery centers. There are 12 in Vermont. There is one in every community. There is one that is near every single Vermonter, right. from Bennington to St. Johnsbury and everywhere in between. And they're sort of getting at what you were referring to earlier. It used to be that substance use disorder was a was a, a hidden condition filled shame stigma and now we know that it's simply a health condition and it's a health condition for which we can bring evidence-based practices and most importantly it's a health condition from which people recover we see that every single day so there is a recovery center near you uh, that you should go visit and learn about even just as a community member. One of the um, great examples of this is the Rutland Turning Point Center mm -hmm. in Rutland. We're gonna be hearing from Tanya and Tracy in a minute, but they've done, I think, two really powerful things. First thing they've done is they've opened their doors to anybody who's interested in recovery with a huge variety of programs, you know, seemingly seven days a week, just amazing the amount of supports they give. They're meeting people where they are at. That's number one. And then number two, they're opening their doors to the community itself. If you ever drop by there and visit, you may see the local police officer just chatting people up or mm -hmm. folks walking in from the street or folks dropping off lasagnas. They're really saying that we are a resource that's here to support the community and the community saying, we love you. We want to support you because you're doing mission critical work. So I love our recovery centers. And I think if you're ever curious about it, their doors are open for you as well. And you should go visit the local one. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. So at this point, we have another uh, tape vignette for a person with, with lived experience uh, in addiction and recovery, and specifically with uh, a recovery center, Tanya Wright. So if we could please uh, play that uh, vignette now. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you so much for being with us. I'll just hand the floor over to you to share your, your lived experience. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Ed, and thanks for allowing me to speak here today. Um, so my name's Tanya Wright. I'm the Associate Director of the Turning Point Center of Rutland. I'm also the Recovery Coach and the Emergency Department Supervisor. Um, I am also a person in long-term recovery. I've been in recovery for about six years now. I started using when I was uh, very young, about 12 years old. Um, my using progressed pretty rapidly um, throughout my teenage years and into my 20s. Mm -hmm. I um, got on a, a maintenance program uh, when I was about 35, uh, one of many attempts, um, but something about this time, um, I was just extremely focused and really, really uh, wanted to, uh, well, I was desperate <laughs> for something, anything different. 
Um, so I was placed at the Rutland Turning Point Center uh, in order to complete my community service commitment uh, because I was receiving reach up at the time. Mm -hmm. I, at that time in my life, um, was extremely, had been isolated for many, many years, um, very untrusting of other people. Uh, I had no desire to be at turning point whatsoever. Um, you know, but it was something that I had to do. I showed up every day, sometimes on time, sometimes not, mm -hmm. um, but I showed up. Um, and I think the thing about it was that when I went there, terrified, um, very shy, uh, very withdrawn, nobody judged me. Nobody looked down on me. Nobody treated me differently. I didn't have to tell my story 8 million times to a million different people. I was allowed to just kind of be. And, you know, the more that I showed up at Turning Point, the more that it started to feel comfortable. And the volunteers and the staff really made me feel like I was accepted and after a while started to kind of feel like a family and, and kind of like home, which wasn't really a feeling that I was accustomed to. Um, so, you know, over time, I went from community service to volunteering. Mm -hmm. So I, I suddenly wanted to be there. Um, and I spent about six months volunteering in that time. I was offered a uh, recovery coach academy, different responsibilities at the center, um, you know, and for me, it was kind of life changing because nobody had ever trusted me with responsibility or believed that I had the ability to fulfill these tasks and, you know, do the things that I needed to do. And before I knew it, really, I was completing all these trainings and I was talking to people every day and doing presentations and meeting with court people and police officers and correctional, like all the people that normally I would have tried to avoid um, were now just community members and people that I met with day to day just in the job. And I think the biggest thing um, that really hooked me for Turning Point was when I started coaching individuals that were like me. You know, Turning Point really allowed me to do something I never thought I'd have the chance to, which is just comfortably and on my time, figure out who I was and what I had to offer. Um, and I think, you know, people kind of overlook that, that when you're using for pretty much, you know, most of your life, childhood into adulthood, you don't <laughs> learn the normal things. You don't know the things that people expect you to know. So having that safe, um, non-judgmental environment to figure out who you are and make mistakes and learn from mistakes and, um, you know, just move forward in your life and your recovery while you're also helping other people do the same. It really was like priceless for me. I, I don't know how else I, I could have achieved that really. Turning Point is a huge part of my life still. I've been working here for five years now, um, worked my way up and, um, you know, it just, it means so much to me. And I know that it means so much to the people that come in every day. Oh, I can't even thank you enough, uh, Tanya, for your honesty and your courage and for being with us uh, here today. Uh, congratulations on your many, many accomplishments. And, and, and once again, uh, just, just thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, Ed. Thank you so much.
So, so once again, uh, we have a panel uh, filled with, with joy. And um, we have a, a window into two people that is just in, incredible. You know, uh, we, we actually got to see a brain healing in action. You know, she talks about it. She says, suddenly, I wanted to be there. That's the moment. Suddenly, something shifted. Suddenly, she went from being terrified to wanting to be there. It's that stigma-free environment that allows people to grow. Two people. She began using drugs when she was 12. Harley said, I never, I wasn't born with, and I never learned the rules that it takes to live. And that's what uh, V4 gave to him. So this is just, uh, these people are incredible um, examples of what you do, what you create, the environments that you create for them to become the people they can be. Recovery supports, just so, so beautiful. I'm going to hand it over to Tracy. I saw you kind of bubbling over with joy. So, so go ahead, Tracy. Oh, I'll probably get emotional. Thank you, Ed. Um, I'm kind of at a loss for words. I Watching that video, I've seen Tanya's transformation. You know, I've been director since she started here. I'm the one that hired her. And it's just such a beautiful thing, you know, to see her gain self-esteem, establish boundaries, have values, have morals, have confidence in herself you know, and what she gives to the people that we serve in our center is amazing. And she's just one example of the staff that I have here. Everybody I have are people in recovery. And most of the time when they start here, they're probably within their first year of recovery. They want to get a job, you know, and it's, they volunteer for a while and, you know, depending on their, you know, ability to show up and, and be there on time and be reliable, you know, they can move into a paid position. Nice. And, you know, with that comes the building of their confidence and the acceptance and, you know, what's given to them, they give back to others. And I think in recovery centers, it's a unique work environment because I, I run my center, not just thinking of the people we serve and how we can support them, but I also have to be supportive and somewhat flexible for some of the staff I have because of their own recovery, things that come up, situations that um, come up. Um, and with Tanya, I mean, I could tell you in the beginning, it was like whatever hours she could show up here to work, I kind of had to accept. I mean, she was a single mom with two young kids. Wow. You know, and so if she couldn't get here till 11 o'clock, she got here at 11 o'clock, but she put forth the work because I gave her that ability to have the flexibility, you know, and I have to do that with all my staff. I have to be mindful of where they're at in recovery. And it's, it's just a beautiful thing that happens. And we are like a family. Um, I believe that's the way it is with all the recovery centers, you know, and, and we, we kind of, I, I'm struggling for the word I want to use, but it's like, we are there before, during, and after. We're there while they're using, we're there when they're contemplating changing, we're there when they're going through clinical services, we're there if they get kicked out of clinical services, we're just a constant, Wow. You know, we're always there as long as they want to come and access our services. Mm. There's no fine line that says, okay, you can't come back here anymore. And, you know, just, I think about our correctional program that we launched here in Rutland when we were going into the correctional facility. And yes, a lot of my staff that went, I mean, Tanya and I were the first ones to start doing that, going into a male correctional facility. Tanya knew some of the people that were in there, but the the way that she was able to learn how to set boundaries with that and, you know, what we gave to them was it wasn't asking them questions about what brought them into jail. You know, it wasn't like, what crimes did you commit? It wasn't picking and choosing who. It was all voluntary who wanted to come to our groups. And I mean, we'd have the room would be full, 20 some odd people as word spread because they just wanted to feel accepted. 
They wanted to feel safe. They wanted to feel like they weren't being judged. And it's, you know, there's many of them. I mean, during COVID when we couldn't go, we still can't go into the correctional facility, but when COVID hit, we wrote letters. Our recovery coaches that were coaching inmates at the, at the jail at Marble Valley started writing letters. We got letters back. We had several individuals that were released during COVID. They stayed in touch. They're still in touch to this day, you know? And I mean, my own story is, is very similar to that. My, my story is, you know, my recovery. I came to my first 12 step meeting here at the center. Wow. I didn't know where I began. I, di I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what to do, <clears throat> but that feeling that, even though it was awkward and it was uncomfortable, that feeling that I felt walking into the center of being welcomed and feeling safe and not judged and not questioned stuck with me. And that helped me get through that uncomfortable feeling of being there, you know, and, you know, and now here I am now the director and, and I didn't plan on becoming the director. I thought I'd go back into nursing, but I felt like this is where I needed to be because if, if, it was given to me so freely and it helped me think about how many more people it can help. You know, it, I don't know. It's just in recovery centers being nonprofits. I think a lot of people don't understand that so many people in recovery want to do this work, but being a nonprofit, that's why I'm so excited about this fundraiser is that we don't have the funding to offer anybody any benefits. I have to limit how much staff I have. I mean, I don't even have health insurance, you know? Yeah. That's the reality of it. And it's a struggle, but we do it anyway, regardless of not having benefits because it feeds our soul and it feeds our recovery. And I apologize for getting emotional, but when I talk about this, people just think you just pull people out of the air to do this work. It's not that lived experience is what really helps other people. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tracy. You know, um, your story is beautiful and, and your rendition of, uh, you know, your experience with Tanya at the recovery uh, center is also uh, uh, equally uh, beautiful. I can see the panel is deeply, deeply touched by, by your, uh, you're sharing, <clears throat> you know, I was, I was part of the North Central Vermont Recovery Center uh, when I lived in Lamoille County. And I used to spend a lot of time there because I too, like, like, like all of us, I'm, I'm also in recovery. And um, it was a place to go to continue to grow and also to kind of give back, as you mentioned, it's so important to us. And um, I can't even begin to tell you how many times I've heard people say, if it wasn't for this place, I'd be dead. If it wasn't for this place, I'd be using. If it wasn't for this place, I'd be in jail. And they weren't being figurative. They were being literal. Um, when, when we started that recovery center in uh, Morrisville, we received $50,000 uh, from, from the state. Susan Bartlett was the... Uh, um, person in the Senate who kind of led the effort for us. But I did some research on incarceration and I found out that it cost exactly $50,000 to incarcerate one person for one year. <clears throat> so it's just, it's pretty incredible the return that we get on the investment in recovery is mind boggling. So I just want to say that to the viewers you know, if you're motivated, don't hesitate. Just don't hesitate. No contribution is too small. And I will hasten to add, no contribution is too large either. You know, so don't hesitate. If you want to give a little bit, go ahead and do that. And if you can't give, um, you know, a donation, uh, donate your, your empathy, donate your compassion, you know, donate your 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 support uh, for for people in recovery in Vermont. I'll open the floor now to to the panel members to just join in uh, the discussion, either about recovery centers in general or wherever you want to uh, 
wherever you want to jump in. And I'd, I'd like to jump in real briefly. Um, <clears throat> th this, this challenge um, it is so critical and important to substance use disorder is both preventable and treatable, but more importantly, with the support that our centers and our homes provide, recovery is sustainable. Mm -hmm. And this challenge is it's not just about raising awareness to the fact that folks recover with support, incredible arm wrapping, almost smothering support from our recovery organizations, because that's what's needed. Now it's time to celebrate what they do to support all of us in recovery. Uh, this is deeply personal to me because when I first entered recovery, I had an outpouring of support that most people don't have. So for me, it's a sense of gratitude. I wake up every day working for a company like Dominion Diagnostics that not just values recovery in its employees, but hires folks like me to support Vermont's continuum of care. Yeah. So I guess I will implore, I will encourage, and I will um, throw out an impassioned plea. Tracy said it best these centers and these homes are nonprofits. They don't have a for-profit mentality, but that all of us, every Vermonter should recognize and be willing to step forward and support in whatever way they can. Yeah. It, it, it says, we value and we thank what you do because we appreciate and see the results of your effort. So now it's time for all of us. And, and a tenant of recovery is about giving more than you take. I mean, that's how we all sustain our lives of recovery because we understand the service component. And everyone here on the screen does this, especially Peter, Dave, and Tracy. They do it every hour of every day that they wake up and work. So my hope is, is that Vermonters will not only understand the beauty and value of recovery, but understand it's time for us all to step up during recovery, during recovery month to support and recognize and value what they do. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ron. Well said. Any, uh, let's uh, just continue with our, um, you know, our, our, our group discussion. We have Harley, we have um, Tanya, you know, does anybody want to jump in? I, I just want to add that I think about generational addiction, you know, the cycle of addiction. And by watching Tanya's video and seeing where she's at right now, if we want to get rid of or, you know, reduce the numbers affected by this disease, we got to we got to change that generational cycle. Yeah. Tanya is an example of that. She has two young girls, yeah. you know, hopefully she's going to break that cycle. That's going to heal more families. That's going to touch more people. It's going to make a healthier Vermont, you know, and, and I think that's, it's not just about one person. It's about every person that that person touches. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Peter, I think alluded to it uh, a little earlier when he, he uh, referenced uh, this concept of a sea change, that, that there seems to be a, a cultural tipping that's occurring at this point when it comes to stigma and eradicating stigma, releasing compassion, and really providing uh, people with the love and, and the care and the support and the services they need to both achieve and as Ron had pointed out, sustain health. And um, it's, it's evident, I think it's more evident in Vermont than it is in any other state in our nation. We should be very proud. Uh, the legislature is behind us, the governor is behind us, the recovering community is uh, incredibly, incredibly powerful. Um, you know, Ron, Ron mentioned, uh, you know, people who are employed in, in um, you know, providing services, and this is crucial to, to this movement in Vermont, but I'd also, I'd, I would not hesitate to give a shout out to the many um, thousands uh, in AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, and Narcotics Anonymous, who tirelessly work uh, in their own way, giving back and supporting each other, literally 24 seven. 
uh, for getting freely of themselves, you know, at any hour of the day, you know, to, in some sense, complement what the people on this panel are doing. They're out there uh, 24 seven, 365 days a year. And um, I think this panel includes, uh, we're, we're all part of that too, but I just want to, um, to recognize uh, them, them also. So who wants to join in now? We have a few more minutes left. We're lucky. Well, I, Peter mentioned earlier Johan Hari, and, and there are a couple of books that, that Johan has written that speak to a lot of the concepts that we're talking about today. And I would encourage anybody to, you know, look those up and, and you know, take a read through. And one of the concepts that's mentioned is um, ACEs in terms of, you know, childhood trauma and the... Um, indicators that that puts on somebody's chances of, of um, developing substance use disorder later in their lives. And, you know, Tracy, I think is right on the money in the sense that as a community, we have the opportunity to change the, the tide and break those generational cycles. And, and that's going to yield tremendous results over a long period of time. And We've tried a lot of strategies as a society to, to, you know, address these types of topics and, you know, we are where we are, right? And, and if folks are interested in, in trying some different strategies and, and leaning on folks with lived experience and peer-to-peer -peer support and, and, you know, sort of going to the experts who are the people who have lived it and, and been through it. Um, this is a, a different way that, that we can go. And I would also point out that we still have a long way to go. Recovery centers are not that old in the state of Vermont, even though the concept essentially originally here, right? Like recovery residences in the state of Vermont, while they may have been around for a long time, this new idea of multiple levels to recovery residences and all paths to recovery, like it's a different concept. And there are still room to grow. I'm sure there's many things that Tracy would love to be able to do at the Rutland Turning Point Center, provided the resources to do it. There are a lot of ways that V4 and other recovery residences would like to evolve and like to focus on people and supporting individuals when they do uh, have moments of crisis. And you know, the administration, the Biden-Harris administration has called out recovery residences in their policies. Um, you know, there are uh, all kinds of new things that are being learned and developed and, and looked at. And, and I would just encourage anybody that's out there to understand that, you know, none of us are perfect. None of our organizations are perfect. We are nonprofits. We are all doing the best we can with the resources that we have available. I mean, Tracy mentioned not having healthcare benefits. I um, work another full-time job and I'm, I'm compensated by V4 for 20 hours a week. And I wasn't compensated at all for the first four or five years the organization existed. And that's just the reality of, of, nonprofits in the state of Vermont and starting from nothing, but everybody cares about the work. We care about Vermonters and we want to grow and we want to get better and we want to evolve and we want to help. People. And to Ron's point, you know, that means that we need your help. Right on. All right. Thank you, uh, David. We have only a few seconds left, so I'll, I'll close the show uh, to the viewing audience. Uh, remember, uh, Harley, uh, remember Tanya, uh, remember the, the great healing forces that this panel uh, tends to put in place and then sustain over time uh, because they care. Remember the importance of caring. And, 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 and if you can, I'll say it just one more time, express your care by, by donating and um, supporting this this great this great uh recovery movement in vermont so so thank you and the screen will linger now um giving you the information you need uh to donate and thank you so much uh to my my panel i couldn't be more proud than to be uh here here with you mighty warriors all of you thank you thank you Ed. thank you